we're going to turn towards our science plenary. Before we begin, I would like to ask for our, our um, science plenary speakers to please come to the stage, Dr. Denise Jamison, who's the medical officer from the Division of Reproductive Health, Dr. Beth Bell, the director of the National Center for Emerging Zoonotic and Infectious Diseases, and Dr. Lyle Peterson, the director of the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, and he's also serving as CDC's incident manager for the Zika response. Again, let me remind you that their biographies are in your participant folder. And Dr. Frieden will return and lead us in our science plenary on preparing and responding to the Zika virus. Thank you. Well, you have the, the real experts at CDC uh, stand, sitting to my right, so I won't go on for a long time, but I do want to just give a little bit of an overview of, of where we are. Zika virus is a public health emergency, and the key risk is the risk to pregnant women and their developing fetus. It's the latest in a series of unpredicted and unpredictable health threats. I've been saying for uh, 10 weeks now that we learn more literally every day, and I do believe it's literally true that we were learning more every day because there's a lot to be known about this virus and its impacts on uh, humans, its control, uh, the mosquito ecology, and the uh, efforts of control. It is a serious problem. It does require urgent action. All of you know that, that's why you're here. So thank you very much for being here. It is the most serious risk uh, is really to the developing fetus. And for those of you who, who don't uh, work with this day in and day out, it's worth stepping back for a minute and saying just how extraordinarily unusual this is. It has been more than 50 years since we identified a pathogenic cause of birth defects, CMV in around 1962. And we have never before had a situation in which a mosquito-borne pathogen could result in a birth defect. So this is an unprecedented situation. Um, we also are, are seeing increasingly that not only microcephaly, uh, but probably a broader spectrum of birth defects are resulting from Zika infection as we gain more information, including miscarriage, potentially other poor pregnancy outcomes. The association with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which looks increasingly certain, um, is not that surprising. Unlike uh, uh, microcephaly and birth defects, we see Guillain-Barre syndrome after a wide variety of uh, viral, bacterial, and other infections, um, and the evidence uh, is increasingly strong that there's a causal relationship with Zika. As uh, Amy Pope mentioned, there is an emergency funding request on the table. Uh, emergency funding requests are intended to address things which are unanticipated and something that's completely unprecedented, I think, is quite unanticipated, something that's potentially catastrophic, and certainly for families, for communities, for individuals, this is potentially catastrophic and permanent, and sadly, many fetal malformations are permanent. Um, the U.S. response is part of a robust, the CDC response is part of a robust response, many parts of the U.S. government. And if I singled any one out, I would be leaving others out that have really been doing a terrific job. There's been a, a wonderful collaboration. You saw, well, I'll single one out. Just yesterday, uh, the FDA approved a new test uh, for safe blood. And this is the kind of day-by-day, -day, very rapid response that we're getting from throughout the U.S. government with uh, uh, coordination across the U.S.G. as needed. Transmission routes, you'll hear more from the folks who, who say this more, but in the big picture, um, Zika is only recently detected in the Americas. The mosquito is the same mosquito that spreads dengue and chikungunya, and our thinking is powerfully influenced by that one sentence. We know that dengue and chikungunya can have an explosive epidemic phase followed by an endemic phase. And so if Zika follows that same pattern, that is what we might see with Zika. However, there are a lot of ifs there. We haven't seen it before. We have not seen sexual transmission of those other viruses in the past. And uh, we need to be uh, uh, really respectful of the degree to which um, natural phenomena are not fully predictable. That's why we need better data. There are three broad patterns of spread, direct bites from an infected mosquito, and that can be in areas where there's active ongoing transmission 
or where there might be sporadic clusters of transmission, transplacental uh, transmission from mother to fetus, and sexual transmission, which is more common than we had anticipated. Now, it is to the day, <clears throat> 10 weeks, since we issued our first travel advisory on Zika. And that was uh, about 72 hours <clears throat> excuse me, after our laboratories confirmed the presence of the Zika virus in the brain tissue of two infants who had died in the first 24 hours of life with microcephaly in Brazil. In that 10 weeks, a lot has been learned, a lot has been done, but we need to learn much more and do much more. So some of the key things we've learned, uh, there is mounting evidence of the link with Guillain-Barre and microcephaly. We now know clearly that this is a neurotropic virus. It invades the fetal brain. We know that there is a range of adverse pregnancy outcomes. We know that sexual transmission is more common than expected. We have not seen this before with other similar viruses. We know that pregnant women urgently want to take action to protect themselves against Zika. And in Puerto Rico, I see Brenda Rivera here, we had a number of focus groups and the women were unanimous. We didn't know it. A good focus group is one where when you come out of it, you knew something that you didn't know going in. And uh, we thought there would be various types of concerns. What we heard really was, we all understand that Zika is a risk. We're all really worried about it. And we want you to tell us what is going to be most effective and how we can do it ourselves. So I think that level of commitment is very important. I sat next to a woman in one focus group and we asked, how concerned are you? And she said to me, of course I'm concerned. If I give birth to a baby who can't feed himself, can't take care of himself, my whole life will be taking care of that child. And when I die, I'll be worried who will take care of that child. So that's the commitment that we all have to mitigate the risk of, whether it's in Puerto Rico, southern states, sporadic transmission, sexual transmission, anywhere. But there's a lot more to be learned and a lot more to be done. There's a great deal we still don't know about Zika, and you'll hear more about that during this session. These are just a few of the key things we've done. Guidance on travel and testing all. The same week we learn information, we provide it openly and objectively. Guidance for pregnant women, babies, children with possible Zika infection for couples interested in conceiving. Clinical transmission, clinical guidelines to prevent sexual transmission. Laboratory tests, and our laboratory staff has done a phenomenal job developing, working with the FDA to get approved and disseminating hundreds of thousands of both uh, PCR tests and MACELISA tests. We're beginning to study how Zika uh, persists in semen and breast milk and urine and vector control and support for pregnant women, safe blood in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. That's just a very small list. We have, at this point, more than 900 people at CDC who have participated in the response. We are activated at level one of our EOC. It's the highest level activation. So key issues, I think, going forward. Surveillance. We need to know what's happening. This is core for us in public health. Um, where it's spreading, where the mosquitoes are, access to diagnostics, and you'll have sessions on that. Ensuring that travel advice and sexual transmission advice is understood and followed to mitigate risk because there are certain things we know. Uh, if you're pregnant and you don't go somewhere that has Zika spreading and you don't have unprotected intercourse with someone who's been where Zika is spreading, you're not going to get Zika. Zero percent possibility. So there are things that we can do and we need to focus on those. Case response. Hundreds of travelers have returned to the U.S. with Zika, um, and we will be talking during the course of the day of the optimal response there. Uh, in an optimal response, if you have competent vectors in your jurisdiction, you want to make sure they don't get any mosquito bites. Uh, and they want to make sure that too, because they don't want their relatives and neighbors to get ill from them. The risk may be extremely low uh, in some areas, but there are things to be done to mitigate it. And you all have seen the risk based guidance, four phases, planning, start of mosquito season, first case of local Zika, and active transmission. As uh, Amy Pope said, we need to be prepared, and this involves being prepared in each of these four critical phases. Some of the key considerations, um, this is my last slide, um, 
for the day, I think, keeping our focus on that key priority, decreasing the risk to pregnant women and women of reproductive age. Second, having an enhanced human-based surveillance for Zika and for birth defects so we can understand what's happening in as close to real time as possible. Third, control of Aedes aegypti. This is a unpleasant mosquito. It's hard to control. It has been referred to as the cockroach of mosquitoes. It lives indoors, in the dark. It bites four or five people with one blood meal. Uh, unfortunately, we found in some parts of the US it has widespread resistance to some of the insecticides. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. If we take a four corners approach of inside, outside, larva, adult mosquitoes, we think we can at least have significant knockdown and potentially significant disease control. But we need to be uh, circumspect about what we promise in terms of 80s control because there's a many decade history of trying to control 80s without a lot of success. However, we now think that with some of the best of the best models from around the country, from around this room, uh, from around the world, we may be able to knock risk down significantly for pregnant women at least for uh, some time. And part of the game plan is if we can mitigate risk long enough and get a vaccine soon enough, then we can come in with a vaccine before there is a major impact. And finally, and not least, sustainable mosquito control infrastructure is key. Um, and this is something that all of us need to work on in all of our areas. Mosquito control in infrastructure is to vector-borne disease what core public health is to infectious disease. It's hard to get people to invest in it when there's not a crisis. When there is a crisis, it's hard to get people not to do things that aren't necessarily the highest priority. So what we hope this planning session will enable us to do is to think about what we do today, what we do in the coming weeks and months, and how we can ensure that we have a sustainable infrastructure. Thank you. Good morning. As Dr. Frieden mentioned, because of the potential risk of Zika virus infection during pregnancy, CDC's top priority for this response is protecting pregnant women and their infants. To start broadly about who's at risk, here are the current numbers of cases across the U.S. states and territories. On the right side of this slide are the numbers of cases in the U.S. territories. Cases of local transmission have been confirmed in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. On the left side of the slide are the numbers of cases from the states and district of Columbia. Zika has not been spread by mosquitoes in the continental United States. However, Zika virus has been associated with travel. Travelers returning to the United States have gotten the virus from mosquito bites during their trip. In addition, a few non-travelers have gotten Zika through sex with infected travelers. <coughs> Pregnant women can be infected through the bite of an infected mosquito or through sex with an infected male partner. If a woman is infected with Zika around the time of conception, the risk to the fetus is currently unknown. However, from what we know about other viral infections, infections around the time of conception can potentially lead to infections in the fetus. If a woman is infected during pregnancy, Zika can be passed to the fetus during pregnancy or around the time of birth. What else do we know about Zika and pregnancy? We know that women can be infected by Zika in any trimester of pregnancy. While we have limited information about the effects of Zika virus infection during pregnancy, as Dr. Frieden said, we're learning more every day. For example, recent studies have linked Zika with early pregnancy loss and other health outcomes. In addition, there is no evidence to suggest that Zika virus infection poses a risk for birth defects in future pregnancies. From what we know about similar infections, once a person has been infected with Zika virus, he or she is likely to be protected from a future Zika virus infection. So now we've talked a little bit about what we know about Zika in pregnancy. Let's now talk about the potential effects of Zika in fetuses. 
Mounting evidence supports a link between Zika and microcephaly, a birth defect that signals a problem with brain development. Other problems seen in pregnancy with Zika virus are miscarriage, stillbirth, and a spectrum of health outcomes, including vision problems and other brain abnormalities. In recent months, the Brazilian Ministry of Health has reported an increase in the number of infants born with microcephaly. This increase corresponds in time and place with a widespread Zika outbreak, which supports the link between Zika virus infection during pregnancy and birth defects, such as microcephaly. In addition, evidence of Zika virus has been found in amniotic fluid, placenta, brain, and products of conception from pregnancies among women with Zika virus infection. For example, studies in, C in a CDC laboratory have found evidence of Zika virus in the brains of newborns with microcephaly. In this magnified image of brain tissue, the circles indicate brain cell damage in the same areas where Zika virus was detected, as indicated by the dark pink stain. Zika has also been found in the tissues of early miscarriage. This provides further evidence of the association between Zika virus infection and poor birth outcomes, such as microcephaly and miscarriage. While we've learned a lot about Zika in a very short amount of time, many questions remain. For example, we don't know how often fetuses are infected by Zika virus when their mothers are infected. We don't know what proportion of fetuses with Zika virus have birth defects. And we don't know the full range of poor outcomes associated with Zika. For example, some infections during pregnancy lead to other problems that aren't apparent at birth, such as vision problems, hearing loss, or developmental delay. We'll need to follow infants infected with Zika to see if Zika might lead to other later problems. But let's now talk about what can be done. On an individual level, pregnant women can take action to protect their pregnancies. CDC recommends that pregnant women avoid travel to areas with active transmission of Zika virus, as shown on purple on this map. Information on these areas is updated frequently and is available on CDC's website. If a pregnant woman must travel to an area of active transmission, she should talk to her health care provider before departing and strictly follow steps to avoid mosquito bites and prevent sexual transmission during her trip. Here are some specific actions pregnant women can take. Pregnant women and women trying to become pregnant who live in or travel to areas with active Zika should prevent mosquito bites by using insect repellents, wearing long sleeve shirts and pants, treating clothing with permethrin, and staying in places with air conditioning or screens on windows and doors. To eliminate areas where mosquitoes breed, standing water should be removed. While Zika is spread primarily through the bite of an infected mosquito, Zika can also be sexually transmitted from a man to his sex partner. For this reason, CDC recommends that men who live in or travel to areas with Zika should either not have sex with a pregnant woman or they should use condoms the right way every time they have sex with a pregnant woman. As I mentioned earlier, we've learned a lot about Zika in a short amount of time, but there's still a lot we don't know. So what is CCC doing to learn more? Let's start with the establishment of the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. In collaboration with state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments, CDC is working to collect information about women infected with Zika during pregnancy and their infants. The top priority for this registry is to collect data that can be used for action. The information collected will direct, public health will direct public health efforts to mitigate the impact of Zika and guide recommendations for the monitoring, evaluation, and management of women infected with Zika during pregnancy. We have helped develop a similar system, the Zika Active Pregnancy Surveillance System, which is specifically tailored for Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory that is already on the front lines of the battle against Zika. We have also deployed CD staff to Colombia and Brazil to provide the on-the-ground support needed to learn more about the effects of Zika during pregnancy. We are also planning to study how long the virus remains in semen, urine, and breast milk among patients with Zika virus infection. To help keep you informed, CDC has published clinical guidelines for healthcare providers. These guidelines are available on CDC web, website and are updated as new information becomes available. 
CDC also has other up-to-date information and resources available on the website. This includes keeping our travel maps and notices updated with the latest information about areas where there is active Zika transmission. In addition, CDC maintains a 24-7 hotline called the Zika Pregnancy Hotline for healthcare providers. Through this service, we are available for any concerns about management and to answer questions about the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. How else is CDC supporting you and your jurisdiction? We're working with states and territories to ensure that they can rapidly identify babies with birth defects, including those born to women infected with Zika during pregnancy. Efforts are underway to enhance birth defects tracking systems to rapidly find babies with microcephaly and other birth defects and link families affected by these conditions to appropriate services. It's important to remember that everyone has a role to play. We need urgent action from all of us to minimize the risk to pregnant women. So what can you do? You can ensure healthcare providers are aware of resources and updated clinical guidance. Facilitate coordination among your state programs, including programs in infectious disease, maternal and child's health, birth defects, children with special health care needs, and vector control. Practice effective risk communication principles. Make sure that people are informed about whether Zika virus is spreading in their area. Ensure con access to contraception for couples who wish to prevent unintended pregnancy. Review resources to ensure capacity for children with special health care needs. And support the U.S. Pregnancy Registry. Health department professionals can help us collect the information we need to direct public health action and mitigate the effects of Zika virus. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, and uh, let me add my welcome to others, um, to Atlanta and to the CDC. I'd like to spend a few moments now uh, talking about how to identify and diagnose uh, cases of Zika. As we've heard, surveillance really forms the underpinning of any effective uh, response, and so we really need a robust and accurate surveillance system so that, we can, that can guide our actions. Now, identifying people with Zika virus infection is challenging because most people with Zika do not have symptoms or have mild clinical illness that doesn't require medical care. Uh, signs and symptoms of Zika virus infection also, uh, when people have symptoms, are quite nonspecific. Um, um, rash, which we found is actually quite common, fever, joint pain, headache, and reddish eyes. And so because um, these symptoms are so nonspecific, again, uh, it's going to be quite important for doctors and for travelers to report travel histories, as I'll show you in a moment. You've heard about the complications of Zika virus infection, the increasing evidence of a link between Zika virus infection in pregnant women and adverse outcomes in uh, babies such as microcephaly, and also about emerging information of an association between Zika virus infection and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a rare neurologic problem that, as Dr. Frieden mentioned, uh, we have uh, seen an association of, um, with other infectious diseases. Now, as I mentioned, um, uh, definition uh, of Zika virus disease is really important so that we're all uh, talking about the same thing and counting in the same way. And so um, a definition of Zika virus disease includes clinical symptoms, uh, one or more of the symptoms that I just mentioned, or Guillain-Barre syndrome, coupled with a potential Zika virus exposure. Um, so uh, someone who resided or traveled to an area with ongoing Zika virus transmission within two weeks of symptom onset, or a link to a person with laboratory evidence of re recent Zika virus infection, for example, a sexual partner, 
or an association in time and place um, with a confirmed case. Again, so important for people to remember to report a travel history. And then laboratory evidence of Zika virus infection. And this third uh, component um, is uh, quite important, and there are a number of particular issues about diagnostics that I think are important for people to understand. So I'm going to spend just a couple of moments uh, talking about this. Um, this is a figure uh, which describes uh, when two different um, parts of the Zika response to Zika virus infection are detectable in the blood, um, and they correspond with two different diagnostic tests that we're currently using. So if you, um, uh, first of all, draw your attention to the vertical line here, um, which um, uh, designate, denotes when uh, symptoms begin, and you'll see that um, there's a first um, curve, excuse me, curve here, which shows when Zika virus RNA, so those are um, pieces of the actual virus, are detectable in, 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 um, in blood. And so um, the period of what this, what we call viremia for Zika virus is quite short, probably somewhere around um, five to seven days after a person has symptoms. We have a, a very good test that detects uh, Zika virus RNA. So if a person um, is identified during this time period, um, there's a test which performs quite well and which will uh, show us whether the person has Zika virus infection or not. But because this period of viremia is quite short, there is obviously a lot of people that may have Zika virus infection um, that we can't detect with this test. And this, of course, is extremely important, especially in the context of pregnant women, as you've heard. So there's another type of test, which is a test that detects a certain type of antibody, IgM antibodies. And um, this um, uh, test uh, becomes positive somewhere around four to seven days after symptom onset and persists for a number of weeks. And as I mentioned, um, we at CDC have developed assays, tests, for um, each of these uh, different um, stages of Zika virus infection. Um, and uh, these uh, tests are available in the state health department laboratories, as I'll uh, show you in a moment. So because laboratory testing uh, for Zika virus is quite challenging, it's quite important um, for um, state and local and territory, uh, territorial laboratories to be supported because they're critical. There are no commercially available tests, and um, these uh, two different tests are available at um, state laboratory response networks um, and a number of Department of Defense uh, laboratories at, this, at the moment. So therefore, clinicians need to be educated about how to collect, how to store, and how to transport the correct specimens to the state laboratories for the tests that are currently available. And the laboratories themselves need to be supported to enhance their surge capacity. Um, with a plan for how to prioritize pregnant women for testing, with supplies and equipment and staff and cross-training. And I'll mention that we at CDC in our laboratories are also conducting the same um, Zika virus testing, and we're available um, to backstop um, state laboratories uh, and um, other areas um, where uh, laboratory testing is limited. Testing for Zika virus infection at the moment is a balance. Um, it's a balance between um, needing to um, look for hard for cases in pregnant women and um, to look hard for local transmission. Again, surveillance really underpins this. While at the same time, at the moment, given our lim limited tools, and the problems with um, the, these tools, we need to balance that against um, our limited lab capacity and the potential for false positives. And, and this uh, balance, I think, will certainly change over time as we improve our diagnostic tests and learn more. <coughs> Identifying and diagnosing Zika is important for clinical care to guide management of pregnant women with Zika infection, and also to monitor certain outcomes, for example, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome in people with Zika infection. And as I mentioned, uh, surveillance is really pivotal for public health action. Um, uh, as you've heard, um, public health action can reduce opportunities for local transmission 
in states with known Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. So um, uh, a mosquito needs to bite an infected person and then bite another person in order for transmission to occur. And so we recommend that infected people avoid exposure to the local mosquito populations by wearing repellent for three weeks after they return from travel. And this is, again, a reason that identification is so important. And this will allow us to detect local transmission early to control spread. So it really um, is a, a community and a public health and a partner uh, enterprise to recognize and respond to Zika virus infections. We need the healthcare provider to be thinking about Zika and the patient themselves to help the healthcare provider think about Zika. We need the state um, uh, or local uh, or CDC laboratory testing. We need that laboratory result to be reported to the public health authorities and then for the public health department to conduct a case investigation. And it's in the context of these case investigations that uh, health departments can investigate local transmission in areas with a vector. They coordinate with maternal and child health specimens to specialists to follow cases among pregnant women and to implement uh, control measures that we've already begun to allude to and that we'll be talking about so much more during the day today. So um, surveillance um, is uh, particularly important for jurisdictions most likely to have Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. And these um, jurisdictions, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Peterson in a moment, should plan and implement surveillance activities to identify local transmission early. And some um, approaches to surveillance may include, for example, uh, enhancing surveillance um, to identify potential cases near travel-associated case, um, testing people with symptoms, um, and identifying unusual cl clusters of rash illness. As I mentioned, we found that rash, and it's generally an itchy rash, is a very common symptom of Zika virus infection among those that develop symptoms. What CDC is doing, we're providing guidance on who should be tested. We're providing guidance on surveillance before and during mosquito season. We're providing guidance about how to prevent transmission. Um, we have um, developed and, distrib and are distributing um, the CDC MAC ELISA test. This is a test um, that um, uh, detects these IgM antibodies that I mentioned. Uh, we've also helped states with a PCR assay, and we just recently developed and received um, emergency use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration for a Trioplex PCR that detects Zika, dengue, and chikungunya virus RNA in one test. And so this will be um, a, a test that will be particularly useful in areas such as Puerto Rico and uh, parts of the Western Hemisphere where dengue, chikungunya, and Zika may be co-circulating. What your organization can do. As we um, have emphasized now a number of times, surveillance provides the data that's needed for action to prevent and control the spread of Zika virus. So strong surveillance is really necessary for us to be successful. Um, activities key to detecting transmission of Zika virus include educating healthcare providers about how to identify cases of Zika virus infection, when to test, and where to report, coordinating and supporting state and local laboratory testing, and supporting um, state and local health departments who, as you've heard, are really on the front lines of this response and are on the front lines of being prepared. And we're just not going to be successful without strong state and local health departments to actually do the surveillance and communicate to the public about how to reduce Zika virus transmission. Thank you very much, and I'll um, uh, introduce Dr. Peterson here. Um, good morning. Uh, uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to discuss some aspects of mosquito distribution and biology, uh, mosquito vector control and its organization and how jurisdictions can be prepared as we approach the approaching mosquito season. So this slide de depicts the estimated range for Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus 
the only two known mosquito vectors for Zika virus in the Western Hemisphere. Aedes aegypti is thought to be a better vector for reasons that I will describe later. Data to create these maps were obtained from mosquito collection records from many sources over the past 20 years, and because data collection is still remains sporadic or not present at all in many places, particularly that targeted for these 80 species mosquitoes, the borders of the range are smoothed and do not de indicate a defined boundary. These mosquitoes most certainly are not present in the entire region depicted on this map. And um, when they are present, they may not be present permanently and may be only intermittently present. This is particularly true for the northern areas of this map. The maps also do not indicate the abundance of these mosquitoes. Thus, these maps indicate a potential range where some Zika virus transmission could be theoretically possible, but in no way indicate the likelihood of virus transmission or outbreaks. On this slide, I've indicated some characteristics of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus compared to the West Nile virus vector mosquitoes, Culex pipiens, and Culex quinquefasciatus. Both Aedes aegypti and albopictus are primarily daytime biters. Aedes aegypti prefers to bite people and often bites multiple people in a single blood meal. This greatly increases its ability to pick up the virus from infected people and in turn greatly increases its ability to further transmit it to uninfected humans during subsequent blood meals. Aedes albopictus will feed on a wider variety of hosts which tends to slow viral transmission. Both species lay their eggs in smaller containers that may dry out which greatly increases the number of possible breeding sites in any setting. In contrast, Culex mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus are primarily nighttime biting and feed primarily on birds. They tend to lay their eggs on larger pools of water that don't typically dry out. As a result of the, these differences in their biology and feeding behavior, long-standing surveillance systems developed for West Nile virus will, will rarely identify these 80 species mosquitoes. Thus our knowledge of their distributions is very limited. Well, most mosquito control in the United States is funded primarily to control nuisance mosquitoes, pictured on the left. This is a picture in Florida. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Karina. <laughs> um, rather than to control disease uh, spreading mosquitoes. So uh, what people commonly may notice is, is that, well, I've got a lot of mosquito bites, thus my risk is greater, but it's not necessarily those mosquitoes that are present in these kind of numbers that are going to cause the biggest problem. Because mosquito control in the United States is primarily geared towards nuisance mosquito control, not vector mosquito control, this has important implications of how mosquito control is organized and funded in the United States. We have recently solicited information on the distribution of vector control districts in the United States, and counties with an identified vector control district are indicated in black. It is important to note that because a county has a vector control district, it doesn't mean it, in, it covers the entire county. And as you can see from this map, vector control in the United States is a patchwork of vector control districts around the country. So most mosquito control in the US is coordinated and funded locally and is divided into mosquito control control or abatement districts. Many are standalone divisions of local governments and may not be linked to state or local health departments, which has important implications for disease control. 
This linkage may be, de be determined by state and local laws and ordinances. Other laws may be relevant for programmability to access properties such as abandoned homes. So who's responsible for mosquito control? This responsibility for mosquito control can vary all the way from, from state level down to pest management professionals servicing individual properties. Generally, pro programs with wider responsibility will be more likely to be effective. So who does mosquito control? The actual conduct of mosquito control varies. Local governments programs may have the personnel and equipment to do the job themselves. Alternatively, some mosquito abatement is conducted by private contractors. Or there may be a combination of efforts where some functions are done by the locals and some are, are contracted out, such as aerial spraying. So, Aedes aegypti and albopictus control often focuses on the individual property level, since these mosquitoes are often found in and around human habitation. Targeted outdoor residual spraying, indoor residual spraying when appropriate, and placing larvicide in containers may be used. Sanitation is also very important, since trash piles such as is depicted in this picture are often breeding sites for 80 species mosquitoes. Widespread space spraying by trucks or airplanes can also be used when required. In contrast, for West Nile mosquito control, the focus is on the community level. This is because, uh, this is because, and, and these, uh, the focus on community control employs widespread space spraying, larvicide in storm drains and septic ditches and tanks, fish or larvicides in abandoned pools, or larvicide in containers around the homes. These are generally the kinds of containers that, that may not dry out. So what can be done uh, before mosquito season? How can people be prepared? One is they can gather and review historical data and maps on the presence of vector mosquitoes, and if, doubted, if outdated, plan new surveys and assessments. It's important to realize, as I mentioned before, that the surveillance for West Nile won't necessarily pick up uh, 80 species mosquitoes that spread Zika virus, so a whole new paradigm is actually necessary. It's also important to develop a mosquito control strategy ahead of time to develop a communications network through your jurisdictional incident management structure, and to engage communities about mosquito control plans and policies, and also to identify staffing capacity, resource allocation, and technical expertise. So when mosquito season happens, it's important to implement all these mosquito control strategies, including immature mosquito monitoring, adult mosquito monitoring, removing or dumping water sources where larvae may grow, using larvicides in water sources that cannot be removed or dumped, and conducting insecticide resistance testing. And as was previously mentioned, we believe there's widespread insecticide resistance in many parts of the United States. And also, it's extremely important to engage communities to perform source reduction. So if Zika cases are identified in your area, it's very important to mobilize the comprehensive mosquito control strategies without delay. And what I've seen in past outbreaks is that a couple of cases happen and then people think about it, and then after a while you have a lot of cases and then people do something. So it's important to mobilize this very quickly to, to nip these kinds of outbreaks in the bud. It's in, um, and it's important to implement a targeted vector control for adult and immature mosquitoes in and with a, in about 150 yards around an individual's location. And that's because that's the approximate flight range of an 80s aegypti mosquito. It's important to intensify larval control and source reduction efforts and to consider adding community-based adult <laughs> mosquito control. 
So with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lyle. Uh, I think all of us have been on a rapid focus, rapid learning, la rapid sharing uh, track for many, many weeks now uh, with the Zika response. And I'll just end with three slides before opening up for a good, healthy discussion, questions, answers, comments, because we have a lot of knowledge in the room. We've wanted to set kind of a baseline so that we all have a certain level of understanding of where the science is today. Um, <clears throat> There are certain things that we hope every single jurisdiction will do. We know many of them have done it already. One is to appoint an empowered Zika coordinator for your state. The second is to review preparedness plans, and I know many of you have already developed these, but uh, having plans that are able to be not just on paper, but exercised, uh, discussed with communities, delicate issues, including uh, mosquito control, spraying, established, surveillance established, that's all part of the plan. Coordinating between state, local, and I would add tribal levels. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, mosquitoes don't notice where state boundaries and county boundaries end. Uh, so we have to ensure that we have that coordination. Implement phased jurisdictional risk-based Zika plan. We've outlined the four phases of that plan that I mentioned earlier this morning. I think this is a really helpful way to break down a big problem into less big problems so that then we can try to uh, work uh, toward progress in every area where we can make progress. Some of the critical domains to act in are communication. And we know that communication is always going to be crucially important in so many different ways, whether it's with healthcare providers, with pregnant women, with male sexual partners of pregnant women, with the media, uh, with uh, understanding and conveying what is happening with mosquito populations, with human cases, with recommendations, with testing availability. Communication undergirds the effectiveness of our emergency response. Surveillance. Uh, we have been able now to develop a, a significant capacity for laboratory testing. Uh, we need to continue to roll that out, roll additional laboratories in, increased capacity. We hope that private sector laboratories will have uh, products on the market. We've actually offered to any private lab to tech transfer on a non-exclusive license agreement our technology that's working quite well. But in any case, uh, we need testing, we need surveillance so we can track what's happening. Uh, mosquito control, uh, extremely, extremely important here. And um, different jurisdictions have both different challenges and different capacities. For the uh, albopictus-only areas, uh, clearly the risk is substantially lower from everything that we know so far. On the other hand, the uh, uh, albopictus is much more widely distributed. It's an outdoor biter. Uh, so there are a, a different set of strategies there that may be effective and different jurisdictions may choose different levels of risk that they believe to be uh, what they uh, think is achievable and acceptable. And that is, to a great extent, a jurisdictional decision. For areas with Aedes aegypti, uh, we have a bigger problem because that is a uh, kind of a homing pigeon on, on people. So this is uh, the primary vector. It's hard to control. There are uh, jurisdictions in the US which have, I believe, model Aedes aegypti control programs that uh, all of the US and all of the world can learn from. And part of our goal in drawing this summit together is to share that kind of expertise. Uh, but there are, I want to really distinguish two different things that I think get, get conflated a bit. <clears throat> On the one hand, there are ways to control mosquitoes with today's tools optimally applied. And we do have a lot of tools. In certain areas where it's appropriate, we think indoor residual spraying will be important and effective. Uh, we've got larvicide, indoors and outdoors. We've got adulticide, adult mosquito killing. And we've also got ways to reduce breeding sites. Now, depending on a uh, wide number of factors, including mosquito densities, 
the natural environment, how crowded houses are, how screened or air-conditioned houses are, the mix of those is going to be different. But we are increasingly hopeful that in most environments, if we have a robust response, we can have a substantial enough reduction in the Egypti population to reduce disease risk. But we have to be humble about it because we've seen circumstances where 80 to 90 percent reductions in Egypti populations have not correlated with reductions in dengue incidence. It's a tough mosquito to control. And what we're doing is trying to optimize the control to reduce the impact, particularly on pregnant women. Pregnant women outreach is crucially important. This is the overarching mandate of the response. And whether that's information, services, uh, advice, testing, clinical care, uh, ensuring that the partners of pregnant women have the information they need, use condoms as appropriate, uh, this also has to be a critical part. And for women who give birth to affected infants, services will be so very important. And blood safety. <clears throat> now, as if we haven't mentioned enough challenges already, I just want to uh, recap a few of them. Um, planning and coordinating mosquito control throughout the US. Um, we do want to ensure that we have a consistent approach uh, we've been able to develop the response plan with input from many of you. Uh, I think you've all found it to be helpful in terms of the phased response plan. I think it's a good framework. Uh, mosquito control in communities that are hesitant uh, or lack abatement districts. It's safe to say that um, in most, if not all, communities, there will be a divergence of opinion, with some people saying, spray more, and other people saying, spray less. So that's something that you as jurisdictional leaders uh, are best positioned to mitigate and to do that with information, with communication, with clarification, and uh, trying to really come back to the fundamental principle we use, which is the risk-benefit ratio. What's the risk, what's the benefit, and what do we as a community choose to do to protect pregnant women? Uh, aligning Zika state planning with uh, community clinical services for reproductive age and pregnant women. Uh, in public health, one of our greatest opportunities in the coming years is to ever more closely coordinate traditional public health and clinical care. And yet again, we see in Zika how crucially important that linkage and potential synergy is. Uh, engaging providers and preparing social services for a possible rise in cases of microcephaly and other birth defects and Guillain-Barre. We're not just about prevention, we're also about care. And uh, we're very fortunate at CDC that not only do we have uh, Zika experts and reproductive health experts and laboratory experts and communications experts and emergency response experts and mosquito control experts, we also have the National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. And uh, the clinical geneticists there, the epidemiologists there have been activated in the emergency response and working nonstop to think of what we can do to support women and families to the greatest extent possible. And of course, addressing blood safety concerns should there be uh, local transmission. Zika requires an urgent and coordinated response. In the US, this is uh, varied risk, varied capacities, and varied response. That means that we're going to see uh, different levels of risk. You've got places that are likely to get widespread transmission, Puerto Rico is already experiencing that. Uh, you've also got uh, places that are unlikely to have anything other than travelers or potentially sexual transmission. And you've kind of got everything in between, depending on the vector and the density of the vector and the human population as well. You can have lots of 80s, but uh, everybody in air conditioning and virtually no risk. You can have relatively few 80s or only albopictus and very little air conditioning and relatively more risk. So it's going to be very specific. There are also varied capacities. And as I said, there are some terrific, terrific mosquito abatement districts. There are also some absent mosquito abatement districts and pretty much everything in between. Uh, and there's a varied response. There are going to be some jurisdictions that uh, take the perspective that this is one of many risks. We've seen dengue, we've seen chikungunya, 
we're going to do all the things that we think are reasonable. There are others that are going to say we're going to have a zero tolerance and we're going to try to have no local uh, Zika transmission, even if that requires an extraordinary expenditure of resources. Um, remember that in the U.S., health is uh, a, uh, um, uh, across the U.S., it's a state affair. So it's not that we at the federal level tell states, this is the way you'll do it. We work with states. We collaboratively come up with an approach that we think will work best in the U.S. as a whole, and that each state, each city, its jurisdiction thinks will work best there. There are things that need to be done consistently across the U.S. and where we provide resources and guidance, information and assistance, uh, and we do hope we'll have the basic concept of what the response should be like, and that's what that four-part response framework is about. We are going to need collaboration across all levels of government to society. I do want to reiterate that we've had some very generous donations from the private sector, and we very much appreciate that. And it's a great example of an all of society response. We need to think about building sustainable epidemiologic, laboratory, and mosquito control capacity. So we're not doing this every time there's a new mosquito-borne disease. Our biggest challenges are speed and scale. Mosquito populations can double in days or weeks. Can our response keep pace? Thank you very much. And now we have uh, at least 20 minutes for questions and uh, comments, suggestions, complaints. There are microphones on the stairs. Okay, great. Dr. Frieden, do you want to moderate and let folks yes. know? Do we have? Okay. Thanks. I'll break the ice. This is Jeff Duchin. I'm representing the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, thank you all very much for those uh, great summaries. Uh, in um, my hometown, a infectious disease trained obstetrician is advising patients not to travel to areas where Aedes mosquitoes are present at this time. And so um, we think that's premature. Um, I'm wondering when and if we'll see any sort of travel guidance related to Zika in the US. Um, if when we have, for instance, I think we may have uh, travel uh, transmission in some communities where Aedes are present. Um, what should we expect from CDC with respect to travel guidance within the US? Thank you. I'll start and ask Dr. Bell to continue. Uh, I think we have to look at the epidemiology. So in Puerto Rico, the unfortunate fact is that they already have hundreds of diagnosed cases, that it spreads as chikungunya spread. When uh, chikungunya was introduced, recognized in Puerto Rico on May 5th of 2014, within eight weeks it was all over the island, and within eight months, 25% of adults were infected. That's explosive community-wide transmission. And that's what we anticipated would occur in Puerto Rico. It does, unfortunately, appear to be occurring. That's why we issued travel guidance for Puerto Rico. That is in the, concept, in the context of widespread transmission. Let me give you two numbers. In the past five or 10 years, Puerto Rico has had millions of dengue and chikungunya infections and uh, there have been about two dozen in Florida and Texas, dengue, dengue and chikungunya infections, two dozen, a little more, uh, 30, um, 19 one year. And, uh, anyway, but you get the point. It's uh, kind of four million versus 40 or something. So the level of risk is nowhere near. Um, even if we were to have local transmission, we don't expect persistent local transmission. In fact, if you look at uh, Florida, they had 11 uh, locally acquired cases, but they, it wasn't a cluster. It was 11 singleton infections that died out. So it indicates that you're not having that kind of cluster-wide spread. If we saw community-wide, widespread transmission, we would make the same recommendations. Uh, we don't anticipate seeing that, but we're not ruling out that that could happen. Um, we base our 
decisions and our recommendations on the science. And maybe Lyle or Beth wants to say more. Uh, I think, um, as, uh, as Tom says, um, we do have, based on what we know from chikungunya and dengue, some uh, relatively compelling I, clues that um, the sort of transmission that we fear will occur in Puerto Rico and is already underway is not likely to occur in the United States. I think that the key here is um, what a lot of people have been talking about, which is um, we base our recommendations on what we know. We get prepared for um, a number of different eventualities, and we communicate all of that so that people um, understand kind of um, what the, uh, at least, you know, kind of what the framework is in which we're working. And this is why I think that this phased plan that Tom has referred to is so important, because it does provide a way for everyone to be talking uh, the same language about individual case and at transmission, uh, mosquito-borne transmission, and widespread transmission. I think it would be very helpful for um, the states and localities and tribal organizations to start to socialize that um, in the community, among healthcare providers, so that um, we are able to sort of send a somewhat balanced message based on what we know now and what we think are um, at least um, the likely scenarios, while at the same time saying, okay, so here's how we would look at things here's when we would look at things differently and make a travel recommendation like Tom is just talking about. We've got a lot more people waiting, so. <laughs> thank you, Brenda Fitzgerald from Georgia. Um, thank you very much for those presentations uh, and for the information and wisdom you bring to it. Uh, I have a specific question for Dr. Bell. Um, I, you mentioned that there were instances of false positives with the current tests we have. Can you please tell us how many or what percentage are false positives? And even more importantly, are there false negatives? Um, thank you. I can't right now tell you what pr proportion, but I can tell you what the scenario is in which we're most concerned about false positives. And this, is, um, goes to, this has to do with the IgM MAC ELISA. Um, and this test uh, detects antibodies, and there's significant cross-reactivity um, with other flaviviruses. So that means that, um, for example, if someone had a dengue infection in the past, this could um, cause the Zika, the Zika macalyza to be positive. So we have an algorithm that um, we have um, provided that we're working with the states to implement that will help to sort out that cross-reactivity. And there's an additional test that is available at CDC, which uh, also further uh, helps to um, kind of sort that out. Um, and at the end of the day, however, there still um, uh, will be um, IgM macalyza test results where we're not able, where we're able to say um, flavivirus, not sure which. So that's the kind of cross-reactivity um, that um, uh, sort of leaves us sometimes with not as precise information as we would like. In terms of false negatives, just to mention um, with the PCR, of course every PCR has a level of, of a limit of detection, and it's certainly possible, especially if a person is, a, is, uh, is you know, like a a week or more out from symptoms that a PCR would be negative. And that's why in that circumstance, we would suggest using a MAC ELISA um, to try to get as much information as possible to make a diagnosis. The, so these tests are, you know, it's great that we have them, we need them, but there are these um, sort of um, uh, um, challenges with them, and I think we're working to certainly improve the performance and come up with some better diagnostics. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. John. Thank you. Uh, for, first, uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Freeman, this uh, concerns vulnerable populations. You made the observation uh, early on, I think, that uh, uh, people are living in, in more crowded conditions without screens, without air conditioning, et cetera, uh, may be more vulnerable. So thinking about urban populations and housing projects, uh, rural populations and trailer parks, uh, uh, what kinds of things uh, 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 would you recommend we do in terms of partnering with uh, federal agencies and, uh, and identifying uh, our, our risk areas and, and addressing those uh, women of reproductive age that uh, are in relatively high concentrations in those, uh, in those places? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Peterson's branch did a study of uh, Brownsville Matamoros, a uh, binational community really, in the dengue outbreak and found that the rate of dengue PCR positivity 
was eight times higher in Matamoros, Mexico than it was in Brownsville, Texas. And the two driving factors were the presence of air conditioning uh, and crowding. So uh, air conditioning is protective, crowding the opposite. More crowded simply means the mosquito can reach more people in a shorter period of time. Uh, so in areas where there is 80s in particular and crowded populations, uh, getting screens up is a useful thing to do. Uh, we've worked with uh, HUD on this. They've been very supportive in uh, Puerto Rico and I'm sure would be very supportive elsewhere as well. It's not easy to do, uh, but there are some temporary screens that we're trying out that seem to work well. In Puerto Rico and elsewhere, we've also used a Zika prevention kit or ZPK. They've been very popular. We'll talk about them later. So I think there are some very specific things we can do and you're absolutely right to focus on those crowded and possibly unscreened populations. Hi, I'm Paul Edestad from the New Mexico Department of Health. We have the added problem of having border populations that thousands of people going back and forth across the border every week potentially exposed. And the importance for us is in terms of Aedes aegypti surveillance, I uh, looked at the map that Dr. Peterson put up of some of our counties that have, quote, mosquito abatement districts. I had to kind of laugh because most of those color in is just one guy in the county who drives a snow plow in the winter and does some fogging in the <laughs> summertime. So, um, but, and I've tr tried for years to try to do comprehensive Aedes aegypti surveillance in my state to know where it is. And hopefully I'm now going to use some of the Ebola funds to actually have a graduate student go around the state and do that this summer. But when I started looking at some of the old literature on Aedes aegypti surveillance, I came across papers from the early 1960s where there was actually the Public Health Service would actually do a nationwide survey for Aedes aegypti and done by what I never had heard of before, the Aedes aegypti um, eradication branch of CDC. And um, unfortunately, it got eradicated before 80s did. Yes. <laughs> but but I, I'm just wondering, you know, to me, to standardize surveillance for 80s Egypti so that everybody was doing it the same way rather than having a hodgepodge of people here and there doing it. I mean, they surveyed over 600 counties within three months with 45 people. And if we have new tests coming on or new ways of eliminating Aedes aegypti and we want to be able to, you know, see if we're being effective or not. I think having a good standardized nationwide surveillance for Aedes aegypti, you know, if we ever do get funding from Congress would be one of the things that I would want to see us do rather than relying on counties that have no resources to try to do that. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think there there clearly was better 80s Egypti surveillance 50 years ago than there is now. Um, and I think there's a couple of points. One is, is that I, it's very clear that we need to develop better maps of where these vectors are actually found uh, and, and figure out where they are and in what density. The other issue is I think Aside from making an immediate, immediate progress in making these maps and figuring out where these vectors are, we really need to have a, develop a sustainable surveillance capacity so you can, you can see where these vectors are in any given year over a period of time. We know, for example, that the distributions of these vectors is changing. California, you know, a number of years ago, didn't have Hades aegypti, and now it does, for example. So, you know, sustainable vector control and surveillance capacity is ultimately what's needed. Sounds like belt and suspenders with federal and local. On the right here. Yes, um, good morning. Michelle Davis, the Health Secretary for the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'd like to thank um, the White House and CDC for convene, convening this summit and the wonderful presentations that we've had. Um, as a follow-up uh, for the, dis the question on uh, vulnerable populations, um, I'd like for us during our planning considerations um, at the federal level and other levels uh, to be reminded of uh, cultural and linguistic, linguistic competency, health literacy, uh, diversity of deployed individuals, and our overall um, outreach techniques. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Good morning. Elizabeth Ford, DeKalb County Board of Health. Um, so if uh, 80s albopictus alba is in, in animals and in humans, is there any concern about transmission through animals? And if so, I'm thinking more of household pets and things along that line. 
Yeah, you know, we have no evidence that household pets, or at least in, in a setting like the United States, that any other host besides humans are important hosts for the transmission of the virus. These viruses, a long time ago, and still exist in, in places like Africa, where the natural transmission cycle was between non-human primates and, and mosquitoes. And, and I think because of that, um, our close genetic relationship to non-human primates you know, makes humans the most likely host. I mean, certainly, you know, over time, we'll want to look at other potential hosts, but as far as the scientific literature to date, in urban settings or settings like the United States, humans are really the only important hosts. Thank you. Not trying to give you extra things to worry about. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, good morning. This is Ben Schwartz from Los Angeles County. Um, for our surveillance for travelers um, with Zika, we've been defining someone as symptomatic if they have two out of the four symptoms of fever, rash, arthralgias, and conjunctivitis. And with that surveillance case definition, we found that 12% of our symptomatic travelers have had positive tests. In Beth's presentation, you pointed out that uh, the definition you, you presented was one out of the four symptoms, which would decrease the specificity of surveillance even further. And in the context of limited laboratory testing, it would require a lot more tests to detect um, those positives. I'm wondering if one out of those four symptoms is a surveillance case definition that you're suggesting and then secondly, if there has been any progress developing a rapid antigen test, perhaps on a urine specimen, given the presence of the virus in urine. Well, you raise a couple of um, very good points, uh, Ben. Um, and uh, certainly, obviously, these case definitions, there always has to be a balance between sensitivity and specificity. This is a case definition that, you know, is, was developed initially in collaboration with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. And I think, you know, we find in the context of many outbreaks that case definitions need to evolve. I will say that I think the question of um, the um, relative specificity of one versus two symptoms is something that um, we probably could explore a little bit more. It was uh, uh, mentioned in an MMWR that we um, put out last week or the week before uh, detailing our experience to date. But in any case, I think that your point is a reasonable one, and as I say, I think we need to continue to work to, with CSTE to kind of refine the case definition and get that balance reasonably um, right for the particular time. In terms of um, the um, a, a rapid antigen test, um, you're, you're right that, um, you know, the virus is detectable in urine. We're in the process of trying to figure out for how long and some of the other characteristics of um, uh, viral excretion in urine. Um, and, but I don't know of any immediate, there's not any near term, like, on the horizon rapid test that I think is going to be um, easily available to us in the, for, in the near future. So Tim Jones, State FB in Tennessee. This is sort of related to Ben's comment, but maybe even a little bit more extreme. The um, how we count cases is really important for public communication. And by the current case definition, an asymptomatic man with virus in his blood wouldn't count as a case. And probably more importantly, a woman that didn't have recognized illness but had laboratory evidence of infection and delivered a baby with microcephaly wouldn't count as a case. Um, seems to me that that could lead to a lot of confusion in our public communication. Well, so, so this is theme and variation. I think that, um, as you have pointed out and Ben has pointed out, there are a number of, um, you know, limitations of the case definition and the limitations and the meaning of the case definition changes as our recommendations change. Um, you know, this issue, and Denise may want to say more about this, about um, the intersection between our uh, recommendations for testing of pregnant women and our case definition is obviously something that needs to be aligned. So I think, you know, um, they are all perfectly legitimate points, and, and we just sort of need to uh, continue to uh, think about what makes the most sense as a ca at, a case, at a case definition at any given time. Go ahead, Denise. 
Yeah, I think it's a really important point because I think these um, case definitions were developed before um, we understood the link between Zika and birth defects. And so I think given our concerns about the potential link with birth defects and congenital, possible congenital infection, it's really important to refine the case definition so that they do include um, these other um, situations. Good morning, I'm Stan Cope. I'm the current president of the American Mosquito Control Association. Um, Aedes aegypti is a very tough customer. And I wanna highlight one of the reasons for that that I don't think has been mentioned and doesn't receive quite enough attention. And that has to do with the egg laying uh, behavior. Uh, the eggs are not laid directly on the water. They're laid uh, at either the water interface or just above it. And after a few days of conditioning, those eggs, even after the water source has completely dried out, those eggs can sit there and survive for months, uh, perhaps even up to a year or more. We don't know exactly why. Uh, but that has a couple ramifications. One, after a rainstorm or flooding or whatever, the mosquito populations can rapidly build up because those eggs will almost hatch instantaneously. Uh, but the second reason has to do with where these eggs are laid, one of them being in tires. So those of you who work in health departments, uh, I would urge, urge you to keep an eye on tire piles. Um, tires get moved around a lot, and those eggs are sitting in those tires just waiting for some water to help them hatch. So just a little warning about tires, which we first heard about, what, 30 or 40 years ago, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're almost at the end of the time. Maybe we'll just take the last three questions really quickly, and we'll have real quick responses. Hi, Oscar Allen from National Association of County City Health Officials. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be in this plan. And putting aside the crystal ball for a second and trying to address uh, some, some sustainable action items. Um, when Dr. Peterson illustrated that map of uh, where counties had mosquito control programs, uh, and also the map where uh, the concern around 80s, et cetera, there are significant, I don't want to use the word deficiencies, so let's use positive language, opportunities for action for the same 80s to break through our defensive role. What is our true strategy for beefing up our support for those opportunities where we know the mosquito can actually uh, cause uh, uh, some breakthrough and allow for that at least our first, second, third, and additional homegrown cases so that we are not waiting for that to happen? What are we substantially doing to truly um, bolster up our efforts within those areas? So I promise to try to get us done on time by having quick questions and quick answers. So I'll answer that by saying this summit and congressional funding. Hi, I'm Kyle Moppert, uh, with Louisiana Office of Public Health. Um, my question is um, uh, about HIPAA. Uh, according to the guidelines that we've received, uh, your proposed guidelines, we should go out from a, a, a case of Zika 150 yards uh, radius. The problem is HIPAA won't allow us to give that information to the mosquito abatement districts. So. You know, we've, it's a catch-22. We, what we've do actually, we do? Yeah, we've dealt with this in some jurisdictions. There are ways around it. We can work through that in the workshops. There are also public health exceptions to HIPAA, and there are ways to do it without uh, violating the confidentiality of the individuals. But it's an excellent question, and we have a law and public health program that can provide a briefing on that as well. Wonderful. Last question. Thank you for taking my question. Jane Korea, Florida Department of Health. And looking at that map, looking at capacity for birth defect surveillance activities in those states is tremendously lacking. And so I encourage you to um, beef up that activity as well. I'll give the same answer. This summit and the follow-up of the summit and congressional funding. Uh, but I want to thank all of the presenters for superb work, all of their staffs for what went into this enormous effort uh, of the, the summit. And uh, this is a working summit. We want to get to the end of the day with much more specific action plans and way forward in confronting Zika than we are now. So thank you all very much. And with this, this session is closed.
by air, by land, and by sea. All routes lead to this southern city. Beautiful scenery and sunny skies attract many additional residents each year. Unfortunately, this climate is also ideal for one of man's worst enemies, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, carrier of dengue and yellow fever. A special meeting of health officials set in motion the anti-mosquito campaign. It was decided that a concerted effort would be necessary, enlisting the aid of every source of publicity, together with the organized individual efforts of all the people. Pamphlets on the Aedes aegypti mosquito were made available for distribution to every home, together with an instruction sheet showing methods of destroying their breeding places, and posters urging definite action. A call to arms found the Boy Scouts prepared and anxious to undertake their duties. After being instructed by their leader, they started on their way to distribute pamphlets and inspect premises. Each scout had received instructions about possible breeding places and was determined to make a thorough inspection of each home. If it holds water, it will hold mosquito larvae. The water in this container is fresh. There are no larvae here, but they could develop within a few days. But let's look in other containers. Ah, here they are. Who would imagine so many larvae in such a small piece of pottery? Any container capable of catching water is a potential mosquito breeding place and should be immediately destroyed or emptied and turned bottoms up. A careful search is necessary to find the hidden containers which provide permanent breeding places. Larvae become mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry disease. Inside or outside, it makes no difference. Man-made containers, small and large, harbor Aedes aegypti mosquito larvae. Discarded containers of this type should always be given to salvage and garbage collectors without delay. Constant protection of the family health demands constant vigilance. All drinking pans should be emptied and washed at least twice a week. Mosquitoes breed continually and are most prolific, one mosquito being able to lay hundreds of eggs within a single day. Horrified? No wonder such a small plant and all those wiggle tails in the water. All water plant receptacles in the home should be emptied and scrubbed twice a week. The stems of the plant should be carefully rinsed to remove any remaining mosquito larvae. A simple operation indeed, but only by such precautions can any home be kept free of the disease carrying Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Vacant lots were found with accumulations of refuse. The scouts punched holes in containers to make sure they would never again be capable of holding water and mosquito larvae. Community cooperation is essential in all health education programs, since cleanup in one area contributes to the welfare of the entire community. Mosquito larvae are often found in unsuspected places, such as old discarded tires containing water. Posters were displayed throughout the city to keep the public ever mindful of the mosquito menace. Store owners contributed window space for unusual exhibits, conveying to the public the danger of mosquito breeding. The aroused public attitude assured the success of the anti-mosquito campaign. Every community has a wealth of resources, but its greatest resource is its people. 
capable leaders can develop the power and ability of the people to assure a victorious mosquito control program. It's up to you.